All right, Tim Regal, welcome to the Masculine by Design podcast. Great to have you with us today. Uh, how, how is everything going? Going great. Glad to be here with you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you are, are a friend of mine. We're brothers inside of the Fraternity of Excellence. And you know, I have been very just impressed with the candor that you uh, bring to the topic of porn addiction and you know your own story and experience overcoming that addiction. And uh, you, you've, you've written a, a, a book that is called Living Porn Free, 10 Steps to Recovery, Redemption, and Renewal. And um, this is just, just a topic that is taboo in a lot of ways. And you know, men don't like to bring it up. And I think because of that, that's why we need to talk about it all the more, because that's why men continue to struggle with this addiction and don't get the help that they need. And they, they don't reach out to other men who can provide that support network you know, like we have inside of the Fraternity of Excellence and otherwise, because we have taken those steps to find those kinds of, of resources and men who can help us. Um, so, Tim, to get started, I just wanted to, to give you an opportunity to explain to our listeners, how did fighting against uh, porn addiction take shape in your life? Uh, how did you start the process of overcoming and why did you make that a mission to start helping other men to do the same? Sure. So I had struggled with with porn addiction for for many years, from my early teens into my 20s, after I got married, after I had kids. And for a lot of that time, it was a constant battle. It was, I was trying to defeat it and to overcome it. Um, there was never a time, I don't think, where I was um, just embraced it and just like, I'm just going to do this and, and, and not feel bad about it at all. There was always a time where I knew it was wrong the entire time I was doing it. Um, but it was an addiction. I couldn't stop. I mean, I, I needed it. Um, and I used it to to cover up other wounds and things in my life. So there would be periods of time where I would go without it to where I could stop for a few months at a time or things like that. But then eventually it would, would you know, rear its ugly head and I would spiral back down the rabbit hole again. Um, so I had done a number of different programs, um, you know, men's retreat, retreats, um, weekends, um, books, videos, courses, Bible studies, all those sort of things. And they would help for a little bit. Uh, but they never really dealt with the, the core issue and never really got any sort of long lasting um, recovery. So this went on for probably, you know, 10 years or more. Um, my wife and I had separated at one point for almost a year, um, ended up getting back together and, and I was good for a while. And then it went, you know, went right back to it again. So now, did you guys separate because of this? What, like either directly or indirectly? In, indirectly. Yeah. 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 Um, there were a number of other things involved, but, but a lot of it, this had a lot to do with it. And so I had tried to get better, try to get, try to get help. Kind of the major turning point was a little over three years ago. I'd had two really good friends of mine who had been close, close friends. You know, we did, I mean, we went on family vacations together. Like, you know, I was uncle Timmy to their kids, you know, and we were very close and they were good accountability partners. They were good buddies. The last time something happened, I got caught and they caught me. So, and they, those two friends pretty much washed their hands of me. And I've, I haven't spoken to either of them since. And for some reason, that was the wake up call. It wasn't years of pain and heartache that had caused my wife, almost losing my marriage, almost losing my two children. You know, all of that for some reason, didn't wake me up, but for some reason, losing my, my drinking buddies and, and, and the guys that all, you know, go over and watch a football game with, you know, my bros, for some reason, that was the catalyst that got me to change. So I got real serious after that. Um, I started working with um, some coaches, some mentors in my life, a good pastor friend of mine, um, really started digging deep into what was going on in, in, in my life and what I was using porn to escape from and using porn as self-medication for. And I realized I had a number of deeper emotional wounds in my life. Um, I had a lot of fear of rejection, a lot of fear of not being good enough, um, a lot of emotional things like that, that, you know, anytime I had something like that happen, I would run to porn to escape from, you know, there's always, almost always some sort of deeper emotional wound that is the true cause of the porn addiction. Some of the guys I work with have, have readily apparent stuff, uh, you know, abuse, you know, grief, um, sexual abuse, different things like that. I didn't have any of that. Um, but I still had some, some things that I just couldn't deal with, that I couldn't cope with. And I used porn and, and sex to do that. Um, so I was able to discover those things, was able to start finding some true recovery and some true healing. 
Um, you know, my wife and I were able to work through some of the things that we had going on in our marriage and, and, and thankfully she was able to work through that process of forgiveness and stick with me. Um, my faith in that time of, of just, just having forgiveness for all the horrible things that I had done and knowing that I hadn't screwed up so bad, it was beyond repair. All those things helped me in my recovery. Um, I got more involved with my church. I started leading worship at my church. And in doing that, I came in contact with a lot of younger, younger guys, younger kids, you know, late teens, early 20s, boys and men, and just realized this porn stuff is just rampant through that age group, just awful. So I started just talking to them about it and be like, hey, guys, you know, I, I struggled with this, too. I, I know what you're going through. You know, if you need help, come to me. And so I started working with some of them one on one and, and mentoring them. I taught you were probably the first person that ever said that to them. You were probably the first man that ever came to whatever the 16, 17 year old selves and sure. said, Hey, you know, <laughs> come to C me. I, I can help you. Certainly in church. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so I ended up teaching like a men's Bible study about it. And, and I started writing just some for them, just some for myself. I started this blog into the wilderness um, and started posting on there and started getting more active on Twitter. And it just blew up on me. You know, now I'm getting, you know, mess DMs and, and messages and emails daily, like, hey, I'm struggling with this. What do I do? And what I realized was men needed some sort of guide of where to start. There's so many great programs out there for recovery from porn addiction. There's a lot of great books, there's great video series, there's Bible studies, there's there's all kinds of stuff. And they're and most of them are good. The problem is a lot of them get too deep too quick and guys get overwhelmed and, and give up so what i needed to do was create something that just hey this is where i start you know guys were coming to me like i don't even know what to do like i, I can't start talking about my deep my past and all the the damage i have in my past when i don't even know how to stop jerking off five times a day like mm -hmm. so what i created living porn free was i call it a how to how to quit porn so it's just, it stops the bleeding, you know, figures out what, what, what the immediate triggers are, starts re, um, rebuilding new habits, and then goes into those deeper emotional work in order to find the true cause. Yeah, I like that. You, you got to start at the foundation, right? And I like that you mentioned, right. you know, that, that you're not, it's not just about stopping that activity. It's about digging deep into finding what are the, what's the root cause, right? What is the source of this, of this, uh, desire to continue falling back into, into this, uh, we'll call it a trap, but, uh, you know, devastating behavior as we're going to, sure. we're going to talk more about how, how that is devastating, but, um, that's great. I think you have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, to find the, you have to treat the disease, not the symptoms. You know, you can do all these things. You can get the blockers on your phone. You can quit social media. You can can do all those things, which you can and, and, and should do and are very helpful to break those habits. But they don't deal with the core issue. You know, I make the comparison a lot. It's like an alcoholic pouring all the booze down the drain. Yeah, it gets rid of that opportunity. It gets rid of that temptation. But it didn't deal with the main issue of why you drank in the first place. Yeah. Five minutes later, when he's driving down the street past the liquor store, right. you know, it, it, that right. temptation's still there. And he's Porn, porn addiction it. is the same way. Like you have to deal with the root cause of what's the why you look at porn. And, yeah. and, and when you find healing in that and you can work through some of those emotional issues, um, learn healthy ways to cope with that to cope with whatever trauma you might've gone through, whatever abuse you might've gone through, whatever emotional deficiency you have. Once you deal with that in a healthy way, then you don't need to run to the porn to escape because you have healthy ways to deal with it. And that's how you find a lasting recovery. Yeah. And you, you know, it's really tough today because you know, our, our kids are getting exposed to this at such an early age. You know, I'm, I'm a, mm -hmm. a father of three, they're you know, 12, 10 and eight. And my 12 year old, when she was 10 years old, man, she was at a, a birthday party a 10 year old birthday party. And one of the girls that was at the party with her had had gay male porn on, on a cell phone and was showing it to all the girls there. And my daughter comes yeah. home and, you know, she's, she was, you know, my, but my daughter, you know, to her credit was the only one that actually, at least in that time frame, had come out and said something to any of the parents. Right. Sure. So she brought it up to us and, and we had to have some tough conversations with her. And then, um, you know, it was like, she goes to a private school and those, these were girls in her, you know, Christian private school class, you know, of all things. Right. right? So, you know, we're, we send her to this school hoping that we can, you know, maybe shield her from this stuff until she's a little older and mature and, and more you know, grounded in her beliefs and whatnot. And uh, you know, it's just real eye, eye opening for me. You know, I, I don't think 
I, I saw, you know, any, even a, a magazine, right. Until I was maybe 13 or 14. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my 10 year old is, is uh, getting exposed to this and, and a, and a girl at that, you know, which, you know, generally right. I think girls are probably exposed to that a little bit later than boys are. Uh, but it, it's just, it's crazy. I, I mean, it's, we need resources to combat this, which is why what you're doing is so important because, you know, got guys like us, you know, how old are you, Tim? You're early thirties, 34. Yeah. 34. You know, I'm 39. You know, what our kids are growing up in today is totally yeah. different. I mean, it's, it's access at the touch of a, of a button on their phone or touch of a screen and exactly, uh, they're, yeah. they're going to be hurting it and really in need of the kind of resources and, and help that you provide. Yeah. It, it's most of the guys that I coach. Now I coach anywhere from, I think my youngest guy is 19. I think the oldest is 63. Um, but most of the younger guys and most of the guys in general were exposed between nine and 12. To their yep. first porn. Sad, and, man. And, and even, you know, the younger generation now, it, 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 it's so rampant and it's so accessible. I mean, even, you know, and, 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 you know, I grew up with the internet and stuff too, but even then you had to, you know, sneak down on the computer in the middle of the night after everybody was in bed, you didn't have it on your phone in bed with you. Right. Um, so it's just so easily accessible anymore um, that, that kids are getting hooked on this at, at a younger and younger age. So yeah, you hate to talk with your kids at nine, 10 years old about porn and sex, but we have to, or they're going to learn it somewhere else and they're not going to learn it right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I I've told all my kids that nothing is off limits. I, you know, I, and, and we have to be intentional as parents too. You know, when our kids bring us something difficult like that to not come down on them. Right. I mean, if my daughter right. would have brought that to me and I'm like, what do you mean you looked at that? And what are you doing? Like, you know, you, you moron, right? The next sure. time she came into a situation that she needed my help, she would not have come to me. Right. So we have to be careful as parents and, and be open and willing to have those tough conversations with them because they're going to have them whether we like it or not. Right. And right. you know, what, right. if it's, if it's not us, it's going to be somebody who doesn't have their best interests in mind to the level that we do. Right. And there's no place that's really safe. You know, like you mentioned, your kids in a Christian school, you think that would be a safe place. You think church and youth group, would be a safe place. And it's not, it's not. In fact, you know, the numbers, at least amongst men are pretty much the same, whether they are Christians or not. There, there's yeah. really no difference. I've seen that uh, as well. I, I, I don't remember the exact figure, but it was something like, you know, 70% of men regularly, you know, use porn. And that's, that's sure. about the same inside or outside of the church. And right. you, know, I, you may have better statistics than that. That was a while ago that I, that I think, think I saw mm -hmm. that and it was off the top of my head, but, um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an epidemic. It really is. Um, sure. now you mentioned Tim, uh, when you were uh, speaking a moment ago that, uh, you knew that this was wrong. So you, this yeah. was, you, this is not something that you dealt with, you know, before coming to faith in Christ, this is something that you were, you, you already were a man of faith and this was a struggle that you had had going on. And, and I know from, uh, just writing about this topic uh, at times on my blog, or you know, I've, I've had another gentleman on this podcast talk about porn a, a few years ago. And, and this is a sacred cow for a lot of people, you know, that they dig their heels in it. No, there's nothing wrong with it. Or it isn't that bad. Or it's actually, I, I've even heard Christians argue that watching porn together can be a healthy sexual experience um, in, in their mm -hmm. marriage. Uh, what, so what would you say to a, a Christian listener who thinks porn isn't that bad or, or, or maybe even says that there's nothing inherently immoral or wrong about it to begin with? Right. Well, first of all, I do think it is, is a sin issue. As a Christian, I believe it's sin. It's lust, and, it, and it's a gateway drug to certainly other sexual sin. It certainly was for me because mine escalated far beyond porn into, into sex addiction where I was, you know, I had affairs and I had hookups and that sort of thing. So but it certainly is, you know, lust of the flesh. Um, but there's so much more to it than that. You know, it's not just a Christian issue. It's just not not just a bunch of prudish Christians saying that 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 porn is wrong. Um, you're seeing so many other issues that that come about it. You know, it 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 leads to something we're seeing majorly amongst the younger generation is porn induced erectile dysfunction, to where guys are watching so much porn that their brains become. Um, changed to where they only get aroused and only can achieve erection when watching porn and they can't even get it up when they go to have sex with a real woman. Um, there's, you're just beginning to start see studies on depression, anxiety, all those sorts of things. It's, it's counter to what the culture says. You know, the culture says porn should be used as a antidepressant, as a, you know, a way to relieve of stress and anxiety. And it actually does the opposite. It, it does worse. You know, you, you get that feeling of shame, you get that feeling of guilt, and it, and it drives further and further into, 
into depression and anxiety. One thing I always say all the time, I said, sexless marriages don't cause porn addiction. Porn addiction causes sexless marriages. Absolutely. So guys get so entranced into porn that they'd rather watch porn than have sex with their wives. They get more sexual gratification, more, you know, they, they, they get so entranced in it that they'd rather do that than have real sex. Um, it, it leads to, and that's just in, in the men. You talk about women, the, the, the uh, body issues that it can cause um, by, you talked about like a husband and wife wanting to watch it together. I mean, how, what's a woman going to feel like if, if you're, you're watching porn, you know, and, and together, you know, she's going to feel like she's not good enough and rightfully so. Um, so there's so many things beyond just a sin thing or just a Christian thing that, that, that porn is just causing devastating damage um, amongst, amongst men and, and even women today. You know, I work primarily, I work only with men and then that's the side that I look at it, but it is a major issue amongst women too. Yeah. I, I like that you mentioned though, the more practical side of uh, the, the destruction that's caused when men use porn and, and tying that to, to it being a sin issue, because you know, one of the things that has really galvanized my faith as a, as a, a uh, as a Christian is looking at the things that the Bible says is sinful, uh, immoral, and then almost, I'll say without exception, you know, it, when we have information on a sociological level, psychological level, you can see a, you, you can see the damages that are done when we, when we sin, when we, when we say, sorry, God, I know you've said this, I know better. It, it always ends poorly. Always. There, there's no right. exceptions. You don't, you don't see studies that say, you know, I know, I know the Bible says that, that we should behave this way, but you know, the, the, the evidence is overwhelmingly clear that if we deviate from that, things are so much better over here. It, yeah. You don't see yep. that ever. Yeah. Uh, we try to blaze our own trail all the time and it never works out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it might, might, it might feel good for a moment. It might work for a little while, but eventually y you're going to be humbled. Yeah. And when it comes to uh, the, the relationship issue, you know, I, I like that you brought up the, the sexless marriage thing, because you know, I think a lot of men just equate that to, well, you know, my wife's not available enough to me. Well, if you're like you said, if you're jerking off to porn five times a day, uh, you're not you don't have that sexual energy inside where you're taking that initiative and asserting yourself and, and following mm -hmm. that that uh, sexual activity through with your wife. And if you think she doesn't feel that if she, she doesn't notice that you don't have that right. sexual desire for her, you, you're wrong. And she does feel right. it, it, whether it's subconscious or not. Um, so that it, it doesn't just affect your ability to perform in the bedroom. I mean, it, it affects your relationship on every single level because that sexual dynamic is that important. Right. Right. And it, it's, you know, a lot of guys who, who look at porn there, that isn't the only problem in their marriage and it isn't the only problem in their life. You know, a lot of times it's a symptom, um, not a cause, but, you know, there's a lot of guys who, you know, they aren't willing to deal with the hard work. They aren't willing to have the tough conversations and, and they aren't being leaders in their home. So they feel like less of a man because they're not doing they're they're, they're out of shape. They're, they're, they're not leading their families. They're, they're not being a good father. So they feel terrible. They feel bad. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not man enough. Well, what's one easy way, quick, easy way to make you feel like a man is to watch porn. It makes you feel like a man without you requiring anything that you actually need to do to be one. So, and that just exacerbates the problem further. You feel like less of a man, then you look at porn, you feel bad, and then and, and you feel worse again, and it just perpetuates that cycle. Yeah, very well said. So, Tim, I wanted to ask you, you know, as a Christian who's struggling with this, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even know how long ago, what, what, what's the timeline on this? I mean, how long ago was this that you were really kind of in the midst of this? And I mean, it was from my, my teenage years to about 30, you know, I'm, I'm 34 okay. now. So it was right around when I was 30 that I, that I really got serious and got, got into recovery. And you, you grew up in a strong Christian home, right? So, so your Christianity is something that you had throughout that, that entire time. Yeah. I grew up in a strong Christian home. My, my father was a pastor. Um, so, you know, I was in the church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I went to a Christian school. Um, so I really grew up grew up in the church and I've considered myself a Christian throughout this entire process. There was never, never a time, even at the height of my sin and addiction that I would have said I wasn't a Christian. I certainly wasn't living like it, but I still had that core belief that, and I would have called myself a Christian. 
Yeah, that's I wanted to bring that up because uh, I would think we talked a little bit before we started recording, but I, I would say probably a majority of, of our listeners on to this podcast are going to be Christian men. Mm-hmm. And I know for myself personally, when I when I fall into sin, especially if it's a habitual uh, habitual type of sin, uh, I feel convicted, man. Like I, I might still continue to struggle with it. I might still, you know, fall back into it. But um, you know, those of us who have the spirit living inside of us, man, I mean, it, you really, you can't get away from it. And so I, I just wanted to ask you, man, how, how did that manifest in your life, man? I mean, was this something where, I mean, it just really beat you down and, and you, you felt defeated this entire time or, or um, was it, did it kind of come and go? Did you get to the point where you were just, you know, so uh, stiff necked that you were desensitized to, to, uh, that conviction? No, I always felt the conviction. I always felt shame. I always felt regret. I always knew what I was doing was wrong. You know, when I, after I'd watch porn and masturbate or after I was off hooking up with some girl somewhere, you know, I'd just be like, man, what are you doing? You know, this is wrong. You know, this is sinful. You know, I'd have these actual thoughts in my head where I read these passages of scripture where it talks about, um, you know, sexual sin and stuff like that. And, 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 and all those things. I was like, man, if I, if I die tomorrow, would I get into heaven because I've committed all this sexual sin? Yeah. You know, but the. Well, that's why I like, you know, part of your book, you know, it's about recovery, redemption and renewal. Right. And, and right. I, I love that. And I want to talk about that. Um, you can go there now if, if you wanted to. But just that that process of forgiving yourself and understanding that, you know, n- nothing you've done precludes you from being able to you know, move past it, move forward and um, be victorious on the other side. Right. Right. So where the passage of scripture that sticks out to me a lot when dealing with with addiction is Romans 7. So in the latter half of Romans 7, Paul talks about his struggle with sin. He doesn't identify what the sin is. You know, maybe it was the thorn in his flesh that he talks about, you know, in in 1 Corinthians. Maybe it was. We don't know. But he says, I know what the right thing to do is, but I don't do it. And I know what I don't want to do, but I still end up doing it. He's like, and it's a struggle with sin. He's not, it's not me. It's the sin that lives within me because we're our sinners by birth. We, you know, we are, we are prone to sin given to our natural desires and our natural human flesh. We will sin every time. We won't choose righteousness. We'll choose sin. But he goes on to say, but I am freed by the grace and forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what makes a difference. You know, it's the sin that lives within us. We have to deal with that. That's that heart issue that we were talking about earlier. The only way to heal that is through the forgiveness that Christ offers to us and the forgiveness that he paid for with his death on the cross. That's the forgiveness we have to know that I don't have to live a perfect life. I'm not going to, you know, we try so hard. We try, like we talked about, we tried our own way every time and it never works. We constantly think if we were just good enough, strong enough, man enough, that, that it'll be enough and it never is and it never will be because we never can be. So we have to accept that Christ fought this battle for us. You know, we don't have to, you know, we think we're not good enough. We don't have to be good enough because we never could be. So to accept that he fought this battle for us and that forgiveness and that redemption is there, but we have to take it. We have to repent you know, you can't just say, oh, I'm sorry for that. Lord, forgive me. That doesn't work if you keep going on and live in the same way. Yeah, you know, I'm glad it's not... you brought that up. Yeah, because a lot of people, they'll take that out of context, right? They're like, well, yeah. you know, if, 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 if Paul just kept falling into this sin and he says, you know, that, that we're weak-willed and, and, you know, forgiveness is going to be granted to us anyway, then right. why not still sin? And obviously Paul talks right. about that in, in other passages, right? That we don't have a, right. yeah. this, this hall pass, right, <laughs> to sin. Yeah, just it's not because, a get-out-of-jail-free you know. <laughs> card. It, it's, right. you know, you have to – you look at a sample from, from John chapter 8 where Jesus talks to the woman caught in adultery. You know, everyone was about to stone her, and, and he called everyone out. He said he was without sin, cast the first stone. And – and, and no, everyone dropped their stones because porn addiction is sin. Yes, but it's sin just like any other sin. There's nothing worse about porn and sex addiction than any other sin. It's sin. But then he told her, you know, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. So forgiveness requires confession and then it requires repentance. You have to change your way. You know, you talk about, I talk about recovery, redemption, renewal, the recovery is the repentance and change. You have to change. 
then you can be redeemed by that forgiveness. And then you can renew your life and live a new life in accordance with, with God's will and to be the man, the husband, the father that you should be. Absolutely. Now, Tim, why do you think that, you know, we talk about what the Bible has to say about these mm -hmm. matters and, and one of the, one of the sections of scripture. So I, I was saved at uh, 25 years old. So I was a little bit okay. later in life uh, and had, had gone through, you know, having premarital sex with a number of different women and, you know, mm -hmm. being addicted to, to drugs, alcohol, all that stuff. Right. And, you know, part of my personal journey just in terms of sex was so, so my wife and I got engaged and we both got saved right around the same time. And we had been, you know, having sex all the time, you know, for the whatever five years we were together before that. And, mm -hmm. you know, when we, when we uh, became believers, we understood that that was not, that was not uh, pleasing to God. That was not a, the path that he had called us to. Right. And so we abstained for, from sex for six months during the, that, that final part of our engagement. It was one of the yeah. hardest things I've ever done. Sure. Right. But so, so no one's going to say that this is easy. Um, but even within the church, you know, we have these commands and, and, and where I was going to go with that is that, you know, one of the, the passages stick out, sticks out to me, uh, that really I held on to early on was Matthew five twenty eight, uh, mm -hmm. where Jesus essentially says that, you know, if you, uh, lust after a woman with your eyes, it's, it's, you're, you've committed adultery with her in, in your heart. Right. So, right. um, yes, you didn't commit the act, but you, in, in your spirit, the consequences are still the same. You know, you're, yeah. you're still, you're still going through that same motion and, and engaging in that same, you know, psychological, um, stimulus and all that stuff. Right. right. Um, now we have these passages of scripture and, but still within the church, like we mentioned, there's really no difference between the amount of men who are addicted to porn inside or outside mm -hmm. of the church. Now, why do you think that is? Is it just because it's talking about porn is off limits or it's taboo? It's, it's not, it's not engaged in, or is there something else that's going on uh, within the church? It's, it's, uh, you know, we're not doing our job to protect young men and, and older men from falling into this. Yeah. I don't think th the church has done a very good job. In fact, I think they've done a terrible job over time of, of addressing this issue. Um, you know, there's always the big three when you grow up in a church, don't drink, don't smoke, don't have sex. Well, by the time you get somebody like me, who's 12, 13, 14 years old, what do you think the three things are I want to do most are when I've just been harped into me, you know, you can't do these they are horrible sins. Well, then you discover something like porn and you're like, Whoa, this is awesome. So what, what else are they not telling me? You know, I think this is great. This feels good. It's fun. It's exciting. It's thrilling. You know, we, we have to do a better job of teaching, especially the young men, the dangers of it. Because they don't see the dangers of it. You know, once you get into porn and they start looking at porn and masturbating, you're like, this is great. This is awesome. You know, so we have to do a better job of that. You know, we can't just teach. The only thing we teach kids about sex cannot be just don't have it because even families that are waiting to have sex let's say there's a young christian couple and they 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 completely abstain from sex until they get married a lot of times there's a lot of bad things that that and, and emotional things that come out when they do start having sex because the, it was it was put as this it was put on this pedestal as oh this sex is going to be this great thing and if you save yourself from marriage you'll have this wonderful sexual relationship once you get married and you know the fireworks will go off and you'll just be in this you know overwhelmed with ecstasy because it's such a great thing and you you waited until you had marriage but they were never taught anything about sex anything about emotional intimacy or sexual intimacy or physical intimacy so when they get in that marriage they have no idea what they're doing and, and, and yes, we should teach abstinence. I believe in that wholeheartedly. I believe that's what scripture commands. And I think that's the best thing for a marriage and the best thing for from an emotional relationship standpoint, too. But that doesn't mean you don't talk about it until it happens. And, and we've done such the church as a whole has done such a horrible job from that. That's why I think so many, you know, men especially are getting involved with porn and getting addicted to the porn because they were never taught anything about sex other than don't do it. Yeah. Do you think, do you think some, some Christians, uh, young men or, or even adults might be using porn as a substitute, you know, saying, well, you know, I'm not going to have sex, but you know, I'm going to, I'll go ahead and watch porn and, and pleasure myself that way. Cause it's, you know, right. it's, it's more acceptable or it's not as bad. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll use that as a, as a lesser evil, I guess. Um, and, and that's some of the messed up things with, with Christian dating that have gone to because Christian dating nowadays, you're expected to be everything that a husband is supposed to be, but not have sex. 
And that's not the way men are wired. You know, they're asking you to have that spiritual intimacy with your, your girlfriend or fiance. They're asking you to have that emotional intimacy. You're supposed to lead, connect, and, and be everything that a husband's supposed to be before you're married. But you, you have to stop at sex. Like, that's the line in the sand. And that's not how men are wired. You know, men are wired when you get that physical, emo that emotional intimacy, that physical intimacy, that, that spiritual intimacy. The next logical step and the next right step is sexual intimacy. So for men, it's so hard to stop right there that they they can't have sex with their wife or, or with their, not their wife, but their girlfriend or fiance. So then they go to porn for that sexual release that that's just naturally coming. Uh, so what would you say, Tim, is a, is a valid solution to that? And, you know, you mentioned, you know, th this, these relationships where, you know, men, they have this deep connection, but they, they have to stop at the sexual intimacy. And you also mentioned, uh, you know, you're a proponent of abstinence, as I am as yeah. well. Uh, how do, how do men navigate that, man? I mean, what, how, how do you deal with that? And I know the Bible right. talks a lot about that, you know, and, and I, I would say, you know, not dating for five years is probably a, <laughs> probably a good suggestion, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that that goes on a number of different levels. Um, you know, we, we have to change the mindsets around, around dating. If dating is designed to lead to marriage. You're not, you're not just dating for fun. Like that's what it's designed for. Um, this whole thing of, and this is a, a, a worldview thing that has now taken place into the Christian community is, you know, wait till you're 30 or something to get married. So you can go have fun in your twenties. You know, we weren't designed to do that. You know, I highly, I got married at 21. You know, we were, had kids at 22. Um, you know, we're not designed the, the, these relationships, these romantic relationships weren't designed to drag on for, for seven or eight years before you get married. You know, so my thing would be teach kids about sex, teach kids about relationships. So when they're of age, they can look and know how to vet a suitable partner and know what to be to attract a suitable partner, what type of man to be, young man to be. And then don't, and then once you find that suitable partner, move through things quicker. You don't have to date for five years and then be engaged for two years before you get married. You know, we're, we're designed to have all those things as part of one so move towards that and get married and have that and then you can have that sexual intimacy and have it in a healthy way because you learned from the get-go how to be a good man and what a good husband is and you develop those levels of intimacy that led to the sexual intimacy and that's god's intention for it yeah there's so many societal issues that play into this man i mean fatherless mm -hmm. homes right is, is a big oh, yeah. one you know the divorce yeah. rates all the, i mean how can children grow up to to understand what a healthy marriage dynamic looks like when you know 50 or more are growing up in homes that, that don't see that right right um so there, there's a lot that that plays into you know the, these issues that that uh are plaguing society quite right. quite frankly um but i do agree and, with and, you and that starts with what you do as, as far as like your, your your family ceo that leads back to the men being the leaders and teaching their kids the 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 healthy habits and the healthy things about sex and porn absolutely yeah. that's where and, it goes back to and it staves off that that possibility of divorce too. I mean, we we right. know that women initiate seventy plus percent of divorces, and I'm not going to say that we can salvage all of them, but I right. do think a, a a large portion of them are being initiated because they married a guy who ended up not being the caliber of man that she needs for him to be Correct. to lead her and lead her children, uh, right. even if she doesn't admit that you know she she wants him to do those things innately, she does. Right. So yeah, it's important right. that we that we we have to attack this in a multi-pronged approach right absolutely um, now one of the things that i i'm i'm big on saying and i don't even know where i heard this but you know people <laughs> typically won't won't uh won't change until they finally recognize that the pain of, of change is less than the pain of staying the same and mm -hmm. so i, I want to talk to you a little bit about you know what are what's the what are the damaging consequences that come from men who engage in porn use and and probably i'd like to hone in on on the, the married married men um, because i know that's something that uh, wreaked a lot of havoc in your own marriage um, how, how does porn use uh, manifest itself in a negative way inside of a marriage or even in relationships with your children? Sure. Well, we've already talked about, about some, um, you know, just the, uh, the breakdown in, in intimacy between, between you and your spouse, you know, you're spending all your time looking at porn, not leading in, 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 in desiring her sexually, you know, we are supposed to desire her and desire her only. And we're spending all this time chasing other, other women online. So it, it breaks down the intimacy between husband and wife. You know, I always think of, of intimacy as kind of a, a, a pyramid, okay? So 
the, the foundation of the pyramid is emotional intimacy, um, spiritual intimacy, um, physical connection beyond sex. And sex is at the, the pinnacle of that intimacy. And we try to reverse that so much. We think all those other levels of intimacy will come from sex when it's the other way around. All those other levels of intimacy build into great sex. And so if you're breaking down the sexual intimacy part, eventually all those other levels of intimacy are going to fall apart too. So if you're not having, having a good sexual relationship with your wife, eventually the, you're, you're going to start resenting each other. You're going to start getting short with each other. You're not going to have that, that emotional, spiritual connection that, that a good married couple should have. So things start breaking down. You know, then you add into it the loss of trust. You know, she's not going to trust you. You know, she's going to feel broken. She's going to feel betrayed. You know, even if you didn't go out and have an affair or, or, or some sort of physical sex relationship, if even if it was just porn, she's going to feel betrayed and heartbroken and rightfully so. You know, she's going to feel like she's not good enough, like she's not attractive enough. Um, and, and, and it's going to lead to all those problems. And then your kids see that. So your kid, you start, your kids start seeing that breakdown of your marriage. You're not, you're spending all this time watching porn and pursuing all these things, you're not leading your family and you're not being the father and the attentive and giving the kids the attention they need. Um, so they, they see that too. You know, it leads to, you know, we've talked about how the depression and anxiety, which, which it just spirals out of control. And then you start seeing guys getting, you know, they, they start seeing, um, you know, physical challenges from it too. Like we, we talked about the ED, but you know, it leads to, you know, just this lethargy and this, 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 you don't care about anything and you get depressed and anxious and stressed. And then that leads to health problems to, to over, you know, being overweight and overeating and all those sorts of things. Um, it, it, it just, it, when it comes to a family, it, it, it can just destroy it from the inside out slowly. You know, sometimes it, it brews over time and then it explodes. Um, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, seeing, for wives seeing their husband involved with that it's a deal breaker for them and they equate it to to cheating yeah. and it's grounds for divorce for them um so you know it can easily break apart that it can escalate to the point where it it costs you money thousands of dollars you know e even if it's not you're not paying money just thousands of dollars in time you know but there's you know, people get into campsites, you know, the only fan things the last year or two here is, has gone out of control. Um, prostitution, all those things that you just spend, can spend thousands and thousands of dollars on and just be devastating to you financially and then devastating in turn to your family. You know, guys have gotten to the point where they've gotten caught with stuff on their work computer and lose their jobs. Um, you know, so it's just the, the negative consequences are endless how far they can go. Yeah, that actually happened. Uh, the last company that I worked for, we had a, a, a guy, they even gave him two chances. Like he, uh, he had walked away from his desk and he had, he had porn on and it, the volume was up loud enough where, you know, his coworkers couldn't hear it. But if you, yeah. if you walked, you know, close enough to his cube, right. you could. And, uh, yeah, dude was given a warning. And then not long after that, they, they caught him doing it again, man, just sitting there, right. you know, having porn on his computer while he works. I mean, but that speaks to how, how devastatingly addictive, um, mm -hmm. this can be for, for men. Right. Right. All those, your, your, the consequences don't, you don't think about that when, when you need this outlet to, to cover up the pain in your life, you don't, you don't think about the consequences. You know, every time I'd went and did something, I wasn't thinking about how this could end my marriage and I could lose custody of my kids or I could lose my job. I was thinking about, I have this pain that I need a saw for and, and, and everything else be, be damned, you know, and, and you don't realize that until all of a sudden everything's gone and you're left with nothing. Yeah. And the, the impact that it has on our children, you know, our kids are very good at picking up on the strength of the relationship that their mother and father have with one another. And, you know, even if you try to hide it, they, they will know that they, they will pick up that, sure. that there's some strain there. And that creates a lot of insecurity and anxiety, even if they're not you know, worried that you're going to get divorced. Um, just knowing that the two people that they're most dependent upon to lead them and guide them in this life are not on the same page and, and are kind right. of at odds with one another. Uh, that that is a, a very very uh, large detriment in the lives of kids and it'll make yeah. your home chaotic it will you know cause outbursts of you know behavioral outbursts and anxiety in your kids and it's it's something you you want to avoid obviously i mean it's very unhealthy for them right right yeah i had to this last time when i got caught by my two friends like i talked about you know my my oldest daughter was old enough to understand and she saw 
the heartbreak that my wife was going through. And so I had to sit down and have a conversation with my 11 year old daughter and tell her that I had cheated on her mother. I had to have that conversation with her because she needed to know what was going on. That's the hardest conversation I've ever had in my entire life. I believe it. You know, and, and, and I know that that caused damage to my relationship with her. I've made great strides in the last couple of years of improving that relationship, but I know that was devastating for her. So it, and it has effects far beyond just you, far beyond just your marriage. It can have effects in the further generations as well. So let's talk, Tim, about that. I, I wanted to, to ask you about, you know, how, because, you know, not every man is going to be coming at this from the same angle. You know, I, th I think that yours is probably one of the worst case scenarios. I mean, honestly, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, being addicted to porn, cheating on your wife, you know, and, but I also think that there's a great story of redemption there. And right. if you can, if you can find redemption from, from as far off the path as you were, uh, I would think a majority of the men listening to this who might be that far along or not quite that far along can find redemption as well. Uh, what advice do you have for guys? I mean, how do they approach that with, you know, if there is a guy who's addicted to porn, you know, maybe his wife mm -hmm. doesn't even know, but right. he knows and he knows the impact it's having, or maybe his wife does know. I mean, what, what advice do you have for guys on, on getting that recovery within that, that marriage uh, union? Yeah. Yeah. My best advice is, is I say this all the time, never, ever give up. You know, I kept battling. I, like I said earlier, I knew all this time it was wrong. I was trying to quit all this time and it took me 15 years to finally break free from it. So don't ever give up. You're never, you're never too far gone. You're never a lost cause. You're never too broken. You're never too sinful. You're never too, too far to be saved. Um, you know, sometimes marriages can't survive and that's okay. That happens. But no one's ever so far gone that they can't find recovery. No one's ever so far gone. You know, there, there were times where I certainly felt like that when I was at the height of it. I felt like, ah, you know what, screw it. I'm, this is just who I am. You know, I'm never going to never gonna defeat this. But we can't have that defeatist mindset. We have to be like, no, you can defeat this. I, I'm proof that if I can break through from this, anybody can. Because like you said, I was in it deep, very deep. Um, things that I don't even like talking about anymore because it, it just the, the, the regret and, and everything that I have of it is, is, is devastating to me, but I was able to find my way out and I was able to find my way out through never giving up and keep trying. And, and people who came alongside me and supported me and loved me and didn't beat me over the head for, for being sinful or didn't come over and say, Oh, you're sinful. You're going to hell. You're, you know, you know, repent or else, you know, they came alongside me and said, Tim, I know you're struggling. I know you're trying and I love you. I'm here for you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to push you to be better. I'm going to give you a kick in the ass if you need a kick in the ass every once in a while, but I'm here for you. And I'm going to let no matter, even if you keep screwing up from time to time, I'm still going to love you and I'm still going to push you and support you and make you to be better. So my piece of advice, best piece of advice is don't give up and find someone who's going to be that person for you. I talk in the book about the story of David and Bathsheba, where everybody, every, almost everybody's familiar with that. David saw her bathing on the roof, had sex with her. She got pregnant. He killed her husband to cover it up. You know, and what, but a lot of people don't know the chapter of the next chapter, which is where the prophet Nathan came and confronted David about his sin. You know, and he, he didn't say, you know, you're, you're going to hell, you're, you're all this sort of thing. He, he talked him through it and, and he was there for him and supported him. And he was there for him even beyond that. You know, he had consequences for his sin. He, they lost that child, that child died. Um, but we all need that person in our lives who loves us enough to tell us the truth and tell us what we need to hear, those hard truths, but yet still loves us enough that they're going to support us and love us and push us through it. So we need those people to, to fight alongside of us. Um, that's what I had. I had a, some, some very close friends and mentors and pastors that were willing to do that, to show me love and, and show me tough love when I needed it and, and help me through it and let me know that I was still loved, that I wasn't too broken, that I wasn't too far gone. And that's what helped push me forward and helped push me to finally find that recovery. I love that, man. And that's why I wanted to have you on here is because you've taken this experience and you've, you've seen uh, that love and support and how that's impacted your journey. And now you're being that for 
the men that you come across who can who can stand to have somebody in their corner like you as well man it's it, that's something we have right. to be we have to be doing as men you know as we as we learn things as we experience things and we be, we become more valuable in whatever sphere mm -hmm. it is we inhabit or spheres we inhabit in life we have to be willing to get to give back we have to sure and that, that those and we're, we go through the experience for a reason it's not to hoard it to ourselves absolutely. It's, it's to use them to help others who are yeah. in a similar situation i believe this is the mission that god has laid up upon my life in my heart to do you know you talk about in in, in, in scripture you know where um you know what was meant for evil god meant for good so he knew throughout this whole time that I was going through and that I would have one hell of a testimony someday. <laughs> and, um, you know, and he knew that he could, could use me. I mean, I don't want to do this. And you think I want to sit here on a podcast with you and, and tell about all the horrible things I've done to my family. I never wanted to do that. I never wanted to write a book explaining all this crap that I went through, but he laid it on my heart. And he's like, Tim, you've gotten through this. I've healed you use your story to help others. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, I, I'm using if, if, if my pain, if, if, if my story, if my airing out my dirty laundry can help another man avoid going into the dark places that my life went into, and they can find the recovery, they can find the healing and they can restore their marriages, like I did mine, then then I'm willing to, to tell every story I've ever had, you know, because that's the, the mission that's God's laid on my heart. Yeah, I love it, man. I, I, I want to just extend a big thank you for coming on because, you know, you're you are very real. You're candid. You're raw. You know, you, you're, you're not holding yeah. back. And I think that's why I know that's why that the influence that you're having on the lives of others is so great. And that God is able to use you is because you're not holding back and you're not saying uh, projecting to be some man that you aren't. You're, you're laying right. laying yourself out there with all your flaws and failures and and also how you overcome some of them. Um, and and yeah. people that resonates with people, man, that authenticity does resonate. And uh, we need more men like you. We need more men inside of the church like you who who sure. don't have to put on this facade of, you know, being perfect and, and sinless and you know no, no issues here. Right. Uh, we need right. men who are willing to step up and say, I've been where you are. And, and I maybe I even still struggle with this. But together sure. we can support each other and we can love on each other and we can you know ascend to heights that would never be possible if we try to do this on our own. Yeah. And that's, I mean, this, like you say, this is me, you know, I, I, you know, I, what, what you see on this, what you see on Twitter is, is, is me. This is my story. You know, I, I, I use my real name and my real face for a reason because we need that authenticity and we need to be able to connect in, in, in that way. Um, you know, I'm not a, you know, I, I coach guys in porn, but I'm not a, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a, you know, any of those things. I'm just a guy who's been through the darkness and trying to help other people through the darkness. Um, you know, I'm just want to be your friend and your coach, you know, so much of what these guys need, they're, they're searching for something through porn. They're searching for acceptance. They're searching for love. They're searching for intimacy. They're searching for it all in sex when sometimes all they just need is a friend. Just someone that says, I love you, man. It's going to be all right. We're going to get through this together. You know, we'll, we'll pick each other up off the ground, dust the dirt off and get back in the game. You know, that's what we need. And that's what I try to be to the guys that I coach is I try to love them, support them, tell them some hard truth if they need to hear it, but come along and fight with them. That's great, man. I, like I said, I appreciate what you're doing, man. I know it's having an impact and, uh, you know, sh sharing, sharing that's not always easy, but, uh, you know, taking that, what would other, others would consider a negative experience and using it for good is, is something that, uh, it's inspirational, man. It's great. Great sure. to see you doing that. Thank you. Uh, so Tim, about out of time here, but I want to give you uh, an opportunity to give any, any final words you might have uh, for our listeners and also just to let them know where can they go to connect with you on social media? How can they uh, go pick up a copy of your book and get coaching from you if they think that that would be helpful for them as well? Uh, so go ahead and take the opportunity to let them know. Sure. My message is if, you know, if you're listening to this and you're struggling with, with porn addiction, with sex addiction, you know, keep fighting. Don't give up. You know, don't don't throw in the towel. Like I said earlier, you're never too far gone. You know, find help. Reach out to someone like me. Um, reach out to someone in, in your church or someone you know and trust. Chances are, you know, most guys have been suffered through it as well. You know, you're not alone. You, you, you may think that you're the only one that's suffering through this when when the stats show us that the vast majority of men have or are struggling with this. So you're not alone. Reach out for that help. Find that person who can come alongside you and love you and support you, encourage you and push you to be better, to be the better man and husband and father that you can be. 
Um, I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching for me where we sit down and, and we go um, sit across from each other. I do most of it on Zoom um, where we'll discuss what's going on in your life and we'll work through those issues and try to find that root problem, the why that you struggle with porn addiction and come up with a basic plan so that you can execute those things you need to do in order to find that recovery. Um, I have my, um, my book series, which is Living Porn Free, 10 Steps to Recover, Recovery, Redemption, and Renewal. That's available in paperback on Amazon. I also have a video course uh, at, online on Gumroad that you can um, find on my, on my Twitter and on my website. That's me on video teaching the steps in the book. Um, you can do another level of that where you get a one-hour coaching session with me as well um, that we can, can, can meet and, and talk and come up with a plan to fight, fight this battle together. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Timothy Regal. Timothy Regal, R-E-I-G-L-E. -E. Um, on Twitter, my, my website, my blog is intothewildernessblog.com. I post a lot of articles on there and, and messages about porn and sex addiction, but also about faith, about family, you know, different masculinity issues as well. Um, so feel free to follow me on there and, and find me on the, on the website. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on, Tim. You guys who are listening to this, definitely check out what Tim has to offer. Follow him on Twitter. Um, it, even if you don't think you're addicted to porn, if you are watching porn uh, with any frequency, you need to get help. It's, it's not having a positive impact on your life, despite what, what anybody tells you. And uh, it is only destructive. And Tim can help you get that under control. So definitely check that out. Tim, thanks again, man. It was awesome, as always, uh, you know, engaging with you. And uh, we'll talk soon, brother. Absolutely.